Aloha, faithful YouTubians. Um, so I'm going to do another one of these page one critiques, but first of all, a bunch of news from the Lawrence verse. And I guess the most obvious is I'm repopulating those shells back there because we're no longer moving. The um, house purchase fell through because the carers and care agency um, that look after Kellen a lot in our house um, had said that they could provide that service 15 miles to the north. Um, but when it came to the crunch and we were actually moving and spent all the money, uh, they said, nope, we can't do that. And um, quality of life is uh, more dependent on having people look after Kellen on a regular basis um, instead of me than having a nicer house. So we're we're staying here and I'm unpacking my books and repopulating the shelves. Um, but that's minor news. The big news is that the SPFBO has found its 10 finalists and phase two began uh, the day before yesterday. So these are the 10 finalists and I recommend you uh, hunt them down. They are um, Tethered Spirits, Small Miracles, The Fire of the Four Bears, Scales and Sensibility, this one, I believe, is called The Thirteenth Hour, and that's the series chat um, title. The Humble Storm, A Touch of Light, A Song for the Void, uh, Mysterious Ways, and the one sent to vex me when it comes to the score table, Miss Percy's Pocket Guide to the Care and Feeding of British Dragons. Um, and if we scroll down, so those were, these are all fine books. They were chosen 10 out of 300 contestants, so that's a stamp of approval on all of them no matter where they come in the contest um and i even um awarded no i didn't award um we'll talk about it in a minute but um i met i was in close proximity to um stephanie burgess here the, the um the finalist with scales and sensibility um on the weekend um so this is the the score table um you can see uh my problem in fitting in the full title of that book and these are the the scores from the 10 blogs that selected them and then over the course of the next six months all of these um empty cells will be populated with scores and we will do some mathematics and find our winner so i encourage you to follow on with that um and see how it all turns out um, and what I was fumblingly um, alluding to a minute ago was the fact that um, we had Bristol Con on a Saturday that's just gone by. And um, let me sip from my coffee. We had uh, Mihir Wanchu from Fancy Book Critic come all the way from America. Um, and he, not specifically for that task, but he kindly um, awarded. Uh, these finalist coins to the fine, past finalist and current finalist who turned up to um, Bristol Comp. So there's one of the coins, uh, there's uh, a sense of scale for it, and here's even more of a sense of scale for it. This is, um, oh my God, how can I have forgotten his name? Um, this is one of our winners. <laughs> um, he bought me a beer. I'm going to, uh, I'm definitely getting old. Let's uh, find. I mean, he wrote The Lost War, and I'm pretty sure he's Anthony. Um, let's go down and see. He was a champion the year before last. And where is the Lost War? Here before last, Mark. Here he is, uh, Justin Lee Anderson. Oh my God. Sorry, Justin. Um, yes, he wrote The Lost War, which I've read and is a fine book and you should read too. It's a champion from 2020. Um, let's go back to, let's hope I have no more senior moments. Um, so there he is with his, his coin at Bristol Con. Um, and really, if I had been on the ball, I would have got a photo of all of the, I think there were eight or seven um, finalists, current and um, former, who turned up. 
and had their coins awarded by Mihir. Um, this one, uh, Alicia Wonstall Burke, who um, I believe came third, probably um, a year or two before Justin, um, and uh, with Blood of Heirs, um, which is part first one in a now completed trilogy. And again, you should check that out. And um, yeah. And we got some pictures from the, uh, the Bristol con itself. It's a very small con. It, it lasts for just a day, um, but it's very cosy. And um, I've traditionally spent my time in the bar, which is this thing outside, outside the con in the same building, um, just sort of <laughs> drinking beer and, and chatting. Here I am with um, Tammy Davis, who's a, a writer from my Patreon, and Luke Skull, who uh, is a grimdark author who uh, wrote... Um, the Grim Company and that's in the trilogy that uh, goes with that. Um, and I'm clutching there um, A Gamble of Gods, which is um, by Mitchell Faywood, other known as, otherwise known as Agnes, my, um, my beta reader who has provided wonderful help with um, all of her beta reading for basically most of my, all of my novels. Um, and this is a uh, a fine book that I uh, recommend you check out um, and it is released on the 11th of this month 11th of November so definitely go get that um, and then I believe we can there I am with Tammy and uh, Anna Smith Spark who is also known as the, the Queen of Grimdark and on that um list I have of the uh, the most grim dark books uh, hers is is very near the top uh a court of broken knives um great prose in that very literary book um give that one a shot and do we have any others uh, there's a whole bunch of us there so there's Alicia um her husband Graham Austin King who is a, a fine author and has um uh I read the law of Prometheus recently and, and gave that five stars at um this is um rob hayes who is two times finalist and one time champion with where loyalties lie um and was on his way to his honeymoon in venice um just stopped off to the uh to the con to um get his coin and drink some beers with us and then we have uh tammy again um it's her husband who was taking all the photos so thanks to him and Anna Stevens, who is another um, grimdark author, who wrote, uh, oh, this is the, um, this is an arc, God Blind, um, which is uh, infamous for a particular gruesome scene with a hammer. Um, and uh, yes, check out, um, and she is also near the top of that um, grimdark list for ranking books by how grimdark they are. Um, and there's Mitril slash Agnes again, me clutching Agnes's book, and Karim Mahouz. I, I apologise for mangling his um, his his surname, but he will take it in good spirits. Um, and he is also a, a writer, um, and he's somebody who I actually have in this list of page one critiques. He's he actually sent me uh, a very early page one of his to critique, so I'll move on to that in due course. Um, but worth pointing out that these were all now seven years ago. So any of the uh, the authors I I critique their page ones have seven more years of, of practice um, on top of the uh, the page ones that I am showing you. And I believe that will loop us around to the beginning. Yeah, well, there we go. So yes, uh, Bristol Con, you can still come there next year, and if, if you're entitled to a finalist coin, you can have it awarded. And I believe. That the organisers um, look favourably on on SPFBO finalists in terms of giving them um, panels and whatnot, and I'm also looking into the possibility of having a, a dedicated SPFBO panel uh, for contestants to talk about it and other contests and self-publishing. And the other big news connected with all of these um, coins is. I don't have it there, but um, we have had some very generous benefactors who have funded um, 
even more coins so that we are now in a position to um, send out coins to all past finalists of whom there are approximately 70 and um, someone as me here has, has kindly volunteered to organize the um, the sending of those um, so that's a, a big task that I'm very glad someone else has, has taken on um, and yes we had some very generous um, donations that funded that because um, although each one is not intrinsically super valuable they um when you're making 50 of them and and posting them around it does get expensive um and the other thing i should tell you all about is this thing yes um so on friday the 4th that's tomorrow uh when i'm making this video uh grim oak press opens for pre-orders on the king of thorns dulux signed and numbered or lettered um 10th anniversary edition of King of Thorns, which um, is leather bound and has illustrations by Jason Chan inside it and is signed. And you certainly want that. Um, and I know the lettered, um, I think there's 52 lettered uh, editions. Um, and those tend have in the past gone within less than a minute, sometimes 30 seconds or whatever. Um, so definitely worth getting in on, on the pre-orders of that. Um, there are rather more numbered ones, but still, you want to uh, be in the queue. Um, right, so let's get on to this, this page one critique that <clears throat> I promised and then probably rambled for about 10 minutes before. Maybe people can just have skipped there if they want to get to this, this stuff. Um, so this is a critique of uh, page one from Betrayal by M.K. Ryan. And I haven't looked up whether that's now a book or not, but... Um, you're welcome to do so. There's a disclaimer, and let's make this a little bit larger. And I will read the uh, the page, and then I'll go through my thoughts on it. It was an odd thing, looking down the blade of a sword. The sun was high, glinting off the smooth metal and into my eyes. The tip of the sword pricked against my throat as I swallowed and contemplated the situation before me. I wasn't even really sure how I'd gotten here. Bandits fanned out in front of me and a raging river behind. Solo's reins were frozen in my grip as she threw her head, picking up on my nervous energy. She'd thrown a shoe, otherwise we'd still be running. We had been out on a hunt and when we were attacked. I worked as a horse trainer for Niall and Helen Byron. They bred some of the nicest horses and hunting hounds in eastern Atreya. It was my job to train the horses and to bring any potential clients out on hunts to put the horses through their paces before they were purchased. An hour off, After an hour in the woods, the hounds picked up the scent and had taken off in pursuit, our party hot on their heels. We were ambushed while crossing a small glade. The bandits had just appeared out of the woods, startling some of our horses. Neil yelled for us to run. I whistled for the horse to the horses closest to me and urged Solo back towards the farm. The bandits gave chase, and I'd broken off from the group, hoping to draw them away from our clients. Sola was fast. We should have been able to outrun any horse the bandits had, but she tripped over uneven ground and she tripped over uneven ground and thrown a shoe. I'd gotten off her, started lead, and started leading her, hoping we had enough of a head start to get to the river and cross before the bandits caught up. Obviously, that had not been the case. The sword pricked against my, pricked my throat again as the man holding it shifted to take a step towards me. I stepped back, feeling the riverbank crumble slightly under, under my heel. I wouldn't do that if I were you, he said, stopping mid-step to see where I'd go. A swim in the river at this point would be lethal. Come on, lass, we aren't here to hurt you, but we can't have you running around telling people where we are. Why do you care, then? If it's lethal, then I definitely can't tell anyone. I edged back a little more, considering the chances I'd survived the tumultuous water. As I said, we don't want anyone to get hurt. Besides, he shot me a cheeky grin and a wink. We wouldn't want such a pretty face to go to waste. I grimaced at the line and glanced behind me at the rapids. The water foamed and misted over, the sharp, over sharp rocks hidden just below the surface. A hundred yards downstream, the water was calmer. We would have been able to ford the river at that point, but not here in the rapids. Okay, so that's the page one. I mangled a little bit of it, but um, I'm always 
messing up when I read these things. Uh, I'm going to squeak some of this and then look at uh, what I thought. I mean, I don't think I say it below, but immediately I'm thinking this whole business with um, getting to the river before they do and, and whatnot it wouldn't have saved her, would it? Because if she can cross the river, they can cross the river. So I'm not really sure what the, it's not like a safety boundary. Anyway, let's look at it bit by bit. It was an odd thing looking down the blade of a sword. So I've, I've been doing some Patreon critiques recently. And um, one of the things that I um, point out is that if you look at the sentences in which you do use the word was, um, which is quite a sort of passive construction, and just rejig them so that it no longer has a was in it, uh, it often reads better and I wouldn't get religious about this. So you, I'm not saying don't ever use was, but if you minimize it, you often find that you are prompted by that exercise to find much more interesting forms of words, um, which also tend to be more direct and engaging. Um, I also, um, I've glanced through this, um, this critique in, in advance of making this video. And um, one of the things I'm pleased to see is that the thoughts that occur to me now when I'm reading these things are very similar to the ones that I've, I've written down in red, which um, doesn't mean I'm right, but it at least means that I'm fairly consistent in my opinions on writing. Um, this this first line, uh, it's not a bad first line. Um, it's got um, some elements of, of interest in, um, in, to it, you know, the whole idea of looking down the sword. But uh, it would be nice to know which way you're looking down that sword. Um, it's not immediately clear that it's in the angry direction. Um, the sun was high, glinting off the smooth metal and into my eyes. Again, this is a was line, uh, and I would be less passive. I would be saying, um, uh, like, um, and put it into POV. This is sort of, when you're, when you're writing a POV, you really want to, and I don't want to get too sort of um, artsy here, but you want to inhabit the character. You want to think of everything that's coming to the page as being prompted by what that character experiences. So don't step outside it and say the sun was glinting off the, the sword. Be in the character. And if you want to tell us about the sun, there's got to be a reason for it. And the reason would be that it's glaring into the person's eyes. Um, and then what does a person do if something's glaring in their eyes? You know, they squint or they narrow their eyes. So if you tell it like that, if you're inside the character, and you tell it like that, it is more engaging. It puts the reader in that character's head better. And the whole point of doing that is that later on when you make, um, you, you can't sort of make the the, the, uh, the reader engage with the character immediately. But, sorry, someone's trying to talk to me through the door. Um, so that's thrown my train of thought. Um, the, yeah, you can't immediately stick um, your reader into that person's skin but you want to begin the process as, as early as possible so that you can um, when something nasty happens to them on page 20 or chapter 10 you've bonded the person that the reader so tightly to that person that they really care you know they care about dangers of the person they care about the person's emotions they care about the person's successes and failures that's the whole point of pov writing so here, um, it, you can make it less passive by getting rid of that was and just saying the noonday sun glared from the metal into my eyes. That's just getting rid of the was. And if you want to get the POV into there more, then you know I narrowed my eyes against the sun's glare off the metal. And uh, I know, you know I'm saying here, drop the smooth. Like this, um, this writing here isn't overdosed with adjectives. Some of the pages I look at are. But this isn't a particularly good adjective because we know that the sword blade is going to be smooth. So tell us if, if it was unexpectedly pitted or had weird ridges on it. Tell us about that, but don't tell us about things that we expect. Um, save your adjectives for when you need them, I say. Uh, the tip of the sword pricked against my throat as I swallowed and contemplated the situation before me. Um, so that first bit actually could be a, a good opening line, a better one. The tip of the sword pricked against my throat. It's in POV. 
talking about what it's doing to her it's pricking you know she's something she's feeling um and it then becomes obvious which way it's pointing as well um and i would put the the full stop there um these people love joining i mean i do it too joining um bits of a sentence together with as and it just begins to grate after a while because people do it too often um, and often the best thing to do is just to make it two sentences um uh this bit here is talking about the band it's fanning it fanned out in front of me it sounds like it's actually happening i think with the band the band it's fanned out in front of me that the with then tells you that it's already happened um, at the moment, it just sounds like in that instance, the bandits were fanning out. And I don't think that's what, what's meant here. Um, this so, um, comes, these these comments are about setting the scene. I don't actually know at this point if I didn't know there was a horse involved, I don't think. Um, and I don't now know if she's on the horse or next to the horse. I assume she's on the horse. Generally, if there's a horse, you assume mentioned to, you assume the person's riding it. Turns out they're not. Um, and so this is a, a lack of um, good scene setting. Um, and I do make the point there that, I mean, I don't know about horses. I'm in no means an expert. But this whole business of throwing a shoe and then stopping dead when you're when you're being chased by bandits. Um, I don't know how bad that throwing a shoe is, but, you know, I'd be tempted to keep on going if it was bandits chasing me in much the same way that um, if my car got a flat tire, I'd continue to drive it if I was being chased by the bad guys. Um, and okay, the horse might come to grief, but um, yeah. Anyway. Um, so yeah, and if, you, if this person is on a horse, turns out they're not, but if they were, then this whole business of swords being held to their throats um suddenly becomes super dangerous because all the horse has to do is twitch and and um the person's dead right now comes a great big sort of um flashback um which really doesn't belong here on page one um so we go into the past tense we had all sorts of details about what was happening no you've been chased by bandits you're at a river there's a sword at your throat this is not the time to go whoa stop stop let's slow everything down and explain stuff about Niall and Helen Byron that's just not the way this um, should go um, and we appear to change this guy Niall's name to Neil um, a bit later on just down here as well um, so yeah this is this is way too much um, information and delivered not in a in the I I'm, I'm fine with flashbacks um, they're fine. They they can often perform good good roles, but don't throw them into the middle of some action. If you'd wanted to give us all of this stuff, you should have started there, or or maybe when the action is finished, um, and she, you know she's got to some safe spot and she can catch her breath, then talk about oh, I wonder if the others are okay, and and introduce us to all of this stuff, but but not here, not with the sword at her throat. Um. There's a lot of these talk of, of bandits and you know it's fine in the first line or two to talk about bandits and that's it but if you can want to say bandits and that's it it becomes a bit generic I, I start to want to know um you know not great list details about them but a, a detail here and there you know are they ragged bandits are they covered in murder are they a different race or a different um species uh are they you know just tell me about something about them you know is one leering at, at her is does one have um an eye patch just something to to make them specific rather than this generic bandits um i complain about the phrase hot on their heels and it's just one of those sort of hackneyed phrases that, that gets overused and nicer to find something else more about this horseshoe um and, and i feel maybe there are there are writer is a horsey person because there's all this stuff about training horses and selling horses and nice horses and yada yada but um, for the, the non-horse person it's either a bit much or it needs to be um explained why throwing a shoe is is such a, a big deal um this obviously that had not been the case that's a redundant line um i'm going through the um publisher's edit on my book two of my library trilogy at the moment and she is uh, ruthlessly cutting out 
pieces where I write one line and then basically explain what happened in the, in the line I've just written. Um, redundancy it comes to all of us um, in one form or another, uh, and this is a redundant line that should be cut. Kills the pace, doesn't add anything. Um, and it's not until here and the, the riverbank crumbling under, under her heel um, that uh, we realise that she's definitely on foot. That should have been made clear earlier on. This this dialogue, so th this page is doing lots of things I like. It's got action, it's got threat, it's got dialogue. Um, and now I'm just sort of critiquing the form of those things. I, this dialogue to me is is a bit sort of wordy and, and uninspiring and unlikely. It just... Uh, I feel it could be tighter and and more convincing. Um, and this this whole business about can't have you running around telling people where we are. I mean, you know, the bandit's going to kill them all, or they're going to let them go. So I'm not quite sure what um, the uh, importance of, of of where they are is. Um, but we'll find out, I guess, if we if we read on. And then, then her comeback is again a bit wordy, a bit involved. Um, I mean, it's not terrible, but it's this this whole harping on about if if it's lethal and the telling people issue, it just doesn't really in POV. Like either she's going to be angry or she's going to be panicking, um, but argumentative doesn't really feel seem to fit. And, and I'd rather be getting stuff about um, her. When you're in POV, a, a good thing to add is um, anticipation and concerns and worries. What are they going to do to me? That one looks like he wants, uh, you know, I've heard that such and such. So and so was caught by bandits. And those sorts of things should be flooding into the mind along with um, a physiological reaction, um, you know, sweating, stomach in a tight knot, trembling hands, or if she's angry, anger stuff but not or looking for a weapon or considering um, other strategies to get out of this, but, but just, you know, this sort of argumentative stuff and then his cheekiness, it, it just um, it feels a bit out of kilter for the situation. Um, and then we have some stuff about looking at the river, uh, you know, a hundred yards of, uh, of fast water it doesn't sound that dangerous in these rocks um, presumably she knows about them in advance because if they're hidden then she's not going to be able to see them by glancing at them um a lot of talk about the river here uh, i would just like this whole scene to, to move on um to cut out a lot of the dead wood and get further by the bottom of the page um but the, the basic elements of it are good um, it's a, a decent opening line it's got um as I say, action, threat, and dialogue. So those are all the things that uh, I recommend as a 101 page one builder kit. Um, and I would just uh, like um, it to be delivered in a, in a slightly tighter, more effective way. Um, a lot of the things that could be established a lot earlier, like the character's gender, the fact that they are on the horse, that there's a horse there and they are next to it. Uh, those sorts of things could, could all be uh, very efficiently delivered to us um, uh, a lot earlier. And that's it really. Um, I think uh, it was it was a decent one and it could become a very good one with, with some tightening. I'm gonna leave things there I am aware that I have rambled on for quite some time. Uh, so thanks for listening and